What makes the story so painful and so painfully funny is that Hunter chooses the presidential campaign of all places to conduct this hopeless search for truth and justice. It's probably worse now than it was in Hunter's day, but the American presidential campaign is the last place in the world a sane man would go in search of anything like honesty. It may be the most fake place on earth. The problem is the sheer quantity of the lies. From morning till night, the person trapped in this jaunt hears nothing but evasions, obfuscations, misrepresentations, half-truths, and not at all truths. The trenchant, off-the-cuff remarks that the candidate tosses off on the rope line were survey tested weeks ago. Those spontaneous bursts of applause at the rally were scripted and even openly rehearsed in front of you, the reporter, before the event even started. My own first campaign trip was typical of what young journalists visiting this world experience. I was so overwhelmed with the sheer number of cardboard cliches that a certain presidential candidate used in his speeches that I literally couldn't keep up. So I ended up creating a numerical shorthand system. One stood for, I don't just believe in the American dream, I'm a product of it. While two was, we have got to take America back from the Washington insiders. And so on. Within a few weeks, I was able to take notes on his speeches easily by simply copying the mindless cliché sequences in my notebook. 1, 9, 11, 14, 7, 3, etc, etc. The only people who seem genuinely interested in the 72 elections are the actual participants. The various candidates, their paid staff people, the thousands of journalists, cameramen and other media-connected hustlers who will spend most of this year humping the campaign along. And of course, all the sponsors, called fat cats in the language of now politics who stand to gain hugely for at least the next four years if they can muscle their man down the home stretch, just a hair ahead of the others. The fat cat action is still one of the most dramatic aspects of a presidential campaign, but even in this colorful area the tension is leaking away, primarily because most of the really serious fat cats figured out, a few years back, that they could beat the whole rap along with the onus of going down the tube with some desperate loser by helping two candidates instead of one. A good example of this in 1972 will probably be Mrs. Rella Factor, ex-wife of Jake the Barber and the largest single contributor to Hubert Humphrey's campaign in 68. She didn't get a hell of a lot of return for her investment the last time around, but this year using the new method, she can buy the total friendship of two, three, or perhaps even four presidential candidates for the same price, by splitting up the nut as discreetly as possible between Hubert, Nixon, and maybe, just for the natural Randy hell of it, a trunk to Gene McCarthy, who appears to be cranking up a genuinely weird campaign this time. Jesus, this gibberish could run on forever, and even now I can see myself falling into the old trap that plagues every writer who gets sucked into this rotten business. You find yourself getting fascinated by the drifts and strange quirks of the game. Even now, before I've even finished this article, I can already feel the compulsion to start handicapping politics and primaries like it was all just another fan Sunday of pro football. Pick Pittsburgh by six points in the early game, 
get Dallas even with San Francisco later on. Win one, lose one, then flip the dial and try to get ahead by conning somebody into taking Green Bay, even against the Redskins. After several weeks of this, you no longer give a flying fuck who actually wins. The only thing that matters is the point spread. You find yourself scratching crazily at the screen, pleading for somebody to rip the lungs out of that junkie bastard who just threw an interception and then didn't even pretend to tackle the pig who ran it back for six points to beat the spread. There is something perverse and perverted about dealing with life on this level. But on the other hand, it gets harder to convince yourself, once you start thinking about it, that it could possibly make any real difference to you if the 49ers win or lose. Although every once in a while you stumble into a situation where you find yourself really wanting some team to get stomped all over the field, severely beaten and humiliated. Once they let you get away with running around for 10 years like a king hoodlum, you tend to forget now and then that about half the people you meet live from one day to the next, in a state of such fear and uncertainty that about half the time they honestly doubt their own sanity. These are not the kind of people who really need to get hung up in depressing political trips. They're not ready for it. Their boats are rocking so badly that all they want to do is get level long enough to think straight and avoid the next nightmare. This girl I was delivering up to the chicken coop was one of these people. She was terrified of almost everything, including me. And this made me very uncomfortable. There is nothing in McGovern's campaign so far to suggest that he understands this kind of thing. For all his integrity, he is still talking to the politics of the past. He is still naive enough to assume that anybody who is honest and intelligent, with a good voting record on the issues, is a natural man for the White House. But this is stone bullshit. There are only two ways to make it in big time politics today. One is to come on like a mean dinosaur, with a high-powered machine that scares the shit out of your entrenched opposition, like Daly or Nixon. And the other is to tap the massive, frustrated energies of a mainly young, disillusioned electorate that has long since abandoned the idea that we all have a duty to vote. This is like being told that you have a duty to buy a new car, but you have to choose immediately between a Ford and a Chevy. McGovern's failure to understand this is what brought people like Lindsay and McCarthy and Shirley Chisholm into the campaign. They all sense an untouched constituency. Chisholm's campaign manager, a slick young Pole from Kansas named Jerry Robinson, calls it the sleeping giant vote. Nobody is reaching them, he said. We've got a lot of people out there with nobody they think they can vote for. After all, he wrote, there are hard and honest differences between the candidates and the parties over the best terms of peace and trade and the allocation of limited resources to the competing claims of military security abroad and civil order and social security at home. This is really what the presidential campaign is all about. Reston is narrow, but he has a good eye when it's focused. And in this case, he seems to be right. The 72 presidential campaign is looking more and more like a backroom squabble between bankers, generals and labor bosses. There is no indication at this time that the outcome will make much difference to anyone else. If the Republicans win, we will immediately declare limited nuclear war and all of Indochina and the IRS will start collecting a 20% national sales tax on every dollar spent by anybody for the national defense emergency. But if the Democrats win, 
Congress will begin a 14-year debate on whether or not to declare massive conventional war and all of Indochina, and the IRS will begin collecting a 20% national loser's tax on all incomes under $25,000 per annum for the national defense emergency. Some book reviewer, whose name I forget, recently called me a vicious misanthrope. Or maybe it was a cynical misanthrope. But either way, he or she was right. And what got me this way was politics. Everything that is wrong-headed, cynical and vicious in me today traces straight back to that evil hour in September of 69, when I decided to get heavily involved in the political process. But that is another story. What worries me now, in addition to this still unwritten saga of the California primary, is the strong possibility that my involvement in politics has become so deep and twisted that I can no longer think rationally about that big screen porch about the beach, except in terms of an appointment as Governor of American Samoa. I coveted that post for many years, for a while, it was my only ambition. I pursued it relentlessly, and at one point, in either 1964 or 65, it seemed within my grasp. Larry O'Brien, now the chairman of the Democratic Party, was the man in charge of pork barrel patronage appointments at the time, and he gave me excellent reason to believe that my application was on the verge of bearing fruit. I was living at the Holiday Inn in Pierre, South Dakota, when the good news arrived. It came on a Wednesday, as I recall, by telegram. The manager of the inn was ecstatic. He called me a cab immediately and sent me downtown to the dry goods store, where I bought six white sharkskin suits. Using a Sinclair oil card, which was subsequently revoked, and caused me a lot of trouble. I never learned all the details. But what was finally made clear, in the end after a bad communications breakdown, was that O'Brien had pulled a fast one on me. As it turned out, he never had any intention of making me governor of American Samoa, and when I finally realized this, it made me very bitter and eventually changed my whole life. At this point, the number of officially uncommitted delegates was still hovering around 450. But there had already been some small-scale defections to McGovern, and the others were getting nervous. The whole purpose of getting yourself elected as an uncommitted delegate is to be able to arrive at the convention with the bargaining power. Ideology has nothing to do with it. If you're a lawyer from St. Louis, for instance, and you manage to get yourself elected as an uncommitted delegate for Missouri, you will hustle down to Miami and start scouting around for somebody to make a deal with. Which won't take long, because every candidate still in the running for anything at all will have dozens of his own personal fixers roaming around the hotel bars and buttonholing uncommitted delegates to find out what they want. If your price is a lifetime appointment as a judge on the U.S. Circuit Court. Your only hope is to deal with the candidate who is so close to that magic 1509 figure that he can no longer function in public because of the uncontrollable drooling. If he is stuck around 1400, you will probably not have much luck getting that bench appointment. But if he is already at 1499, he won't hesitate to offer you the first opening on the US Supreme Court. And if you catch him peaked at 1505 or so, you can squeeze him for almost anything you want. The game will get heavy sometimes. You don't want to go around putting the squeeze on people unless you are absolutely clean. No skeletons in the closet, no secret vices, because if your vote is important and your price is high, 
the fixer man will have already checked you out by the time he offers to buy you a drink. If you bribed a traffic court clerk two years ago to bury a drunk driving charge, the fixer might suddenly confront you with a photostat of the citation you thought had been burned. When that happens, you're fucked. Your price just went down to zero and you are no longer an uncommitted delegate. The ABM movement, anybody but McGovern, was a coalition of desperate losers thrown together at the last moment by big labor chief George Meany and his axeman Al Barkhan. Hubert Humphrey was pressed into service as the front man for ABM, and he quickly signed up the others. Big Ed, Scoop Jackson, Terry Sanford, Shirley Chisholm, all the heavies. The ABM movement came together officially sometime in the middle of the week just before the convention, when it finally became apparent that massive fraud, treachery and violence was the only way to prevent McGovern from getting the nomination. And what followed, once this fact was accepted by all parties involved, will hopefully go down in history as one of the most shameful episodes in all the history of the democratic process. It was like a scene from the final hours of the Roman Empire. Everywhere you looked, some prominent politician was degrading himself in public. By noon on Sunday, both Humphrey and Muskie were so desperate that they came out of their holes and appeared, trailing a mob of photographers and TV crews in the lobby of the Fontainebleau, the Nexus Hotel about 500 yards down the beach from the Doral racing back and forth from one caucus or press conference to another, trying to make any deal available on any terms that might possibly buy enough votes to deny McGovern a first ballot victory. The ABM strategy, a very shrewd plan on paper, was to hold McGovern under the 1500 mark for two ballots, forcing him to peak without winning, then confront the convention with an alternative ABM candidate on the third ballot, and if that failed, try another ABM candidate on the fourth ballot, then yet another on the fifth, etc., on into infinity for as many ballots as it would take to nominate somebody acceptable to the mini daily axis. The name didn't matter. It didn't even make much difference if he, she, or it couldn't possibly beat Nixon in November. The only thing that mattered to the mini daily crowd was keeping control of the party. And this meant the nominee would have to be some loyal whore with more debts to big labor than he could ever hope to pay. Somebody like Hubert Humphrey or a hungry opportunist like Terry Sanford. Anybody but George McGovern, the only candidate in Miami that week who would be under no obligation to give either Meany or Daly his private number if he ever moved into the White House. If they knew where they were, if you knew where they were, but chances are any manhole cover you pick up in the city you're gonna find telephone lines laid under it. We pointed that out to Southern Bell and they suggested that we weld the manhole covers down, which we agreed to. The only other vulnerable spot was in the hotel itself. There is a switching room at the back side of the hotel behind the room where all the press equipment was set up. That was the other vulnerable spot. So we had an armed guard placed on that. A guy with an axe could have demolished the communication system in 30 seconds. You can do some of those things at a convention, cause everybody forgets about it five days after it happens. Once the word goes in, they don't recall any situation where the crookedest of things may have changed it. There is no protest. There have been terrible things that happen at conventions. Yeah, I'm surprised this thing went off as well as it did. You were dealing with a gang of real scum, the kind of people Barkhan and Meany and those AFL-CIO people could have brought in. Well, they did. 
They brought them in and we beat them. I mean, people with axes, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, they wouldn't have hesitated if they had the chance. Jesus, why do I write things like that? I must be getting sick, or maybe just tired of writing about these greasy Rotarian bastards. I think it's time to move on to something else, but first I guess I should finish off that story about how Nixon sold his party down the river. It was basically a straight across trade, Agnew for McGovern. By welcoming all the right-wingers and yahoos back into the front ranks of the party, then watching silently as liberals fought vainly for a fair share of the delegate seats in 76, Nixon aimed the party as far towards the right as he could, while charting his own course straight down the center and opening wide his arms to all those poor homeless Democrats who got driven out of their own party by that jew-baiting, strike-busting, radical bastard George McGovern, the Goldwater of the left. Meanwhile, Barry Goldwater himself is riding high again in the GOP. The party is back in step with him now, and by the time the 76 convention rolls around, Spiro Agnew is likely to find himself hooted off the podium, like Rockefeller in 64, as a useless backsliding liberal. That convention will want to nominate one of their own, and whoever emerges to carry the party colors will almost certainly be doomed from the start and mocked by all the Humphrey Meany Democrats, who will have gone home by then as the McGovern of the right. There may not be much difference between Democrats and Republicans. I have made that argument myself, with considerable venom as I recall, over the past 10 months. But only a blind geek or a waterhead could miss the difference between McGovern and Richard Nixon. Granted, they are both white men and both are politicians, but the similarity ends right there. And from that point on, the difference is so vast that anybody who can't see it deserves whatever happens to them if Nixon gets re-elected due to apathy, stupidity, or laziness on the part of potential McGovern voters. If George gets stomped in November, it will not be because of anything Nixon did to him. The blame will trace straight back to his brain trust, to whoever had his ear tight enough to convince him that all that bullshit about new politics was fine for the primaries, but it would never work against Nixon. So he would have to abandon his original power base after Miami and swiftly move to consolidate the one he had just shattered. The meany, daily, Humphrey, musky axis, the senile remnants of the Democratic Party's once powerful Roosevelt coalition. McGovern agreed. He went to Texas and praised LBJ. He revised his economic program to make it more palatable on Wall Street. He went to Chicago and endorsed the whole daily Democratic ticket including state's attorney Ed Hanrahan, who is still under indictment on felony conspiracy obstruction of justice charges for his role in a police raid on local Black Panther headquarters three years ago that resulted in the murder of Fred Hampton. My brain has gone numb from this madness. After squatting for 13 days in this scum-crusted room on the top floor of the Washington Hilton, writing feverishly night after night on the homestretch realities of this goddamn wretched campaign, I am beginning to wonder what in the name of Twisted Jesus ever possessed me to come here in the first place. What kind of madness lured me back to this stinking swamp of a town? Am I turning into a politics junkie? It's not a happy thought, particularly when I see what it's done to all the others. 
after two weeks in Woody Creek, getting back on the press plane was like going back to the cancer ward. Some of the best people in the press corps looked so physically ravaged that it was painful to even see them, much less stand around and make small talk. Many appear to be in the terminal stages of campaign bloat, a gruesome kind of false fat condition that is said to be connected somehow with the failing adrenal glands. The swelling begins within 24 hours of the moment when the victim first begins to suspect that the campaign is essentially meaningless. At that point, the body's entire adrenal supply is sucked back into the gizzard and nothing either candidate says, does or generates will cause it to rise again. And without adrenaline, the flesh begins to swell, the eyes fill with blood and grow smaller in the face. The jowls puff out from the cheekbones, the neck flesh droops, and the belly swells up like a frog's throat. The brain fills with noxious waste fluids. The tongue is rubbed raw on the molars, and the basic perception antenna begin dying like hairs in a bonfire. I would like to think, or at least claim to think, out of charity if nothing else, that campaign bloat is at the root of this hellish angst that boils up to obscure my vision every time I try to write anything serious about presidential politics. After his speech in Kentucky that night, Frank and I spent about three hours in a roadside hamburger stand talking about the campaign. Three weeks earlier, just after the election, he had said that three people were responsible for McGovern's defeat. Tom Eagleton, Hubert Humphrey and Arthur Bremer. But now he seemed more inclined to go along with the New York Times Yankelovich poll, which attributed Nixon's lopsided victory to a rising tide of right-bent, non-verbalized racism in the American electorate. The other McGovern staffers I'd talked to had already cited that latent racism theory, but there was no consensus on it. Gary Hart and Pat Cadell, for example, felt that the Eagleton affair had been such a devastating blow to the whole campaign machinery that nothing else really mattered. Frank disagreed, but there was no time to pursue it that night in Owensboro. At the crack of dawn the next morning, we had to catch a plane back to Washington where the Democratic National Committee was scheduled to meet the next day, Saturday, December 9, for the long-awaited purge of the McGovernites. There was not much doubt about the outcome. In the wake of McGovern's defeat, the party was careening to the right. John Connolly's Texas protege, Robert Strauss, already had more than enough votes to defeat McGovern's appointee, Jean Westwood, and replace her as Democratic National Chairman which is exactly what happened the next day. George's short-lived fantasy of taking over the party and remolding it in his own image had withered and died in the five short months since Miami. Now the old boys were back in charge. Just why the American electorate gave the present administration such an overwhelming mandate in November remains something of a mystery to me. I firmly believed throughout 1971 that the major hurdle in winning the presidency was winning the Democratic nomination. I believed that any reasonable Democrat could defeat President Nixon. I now think that no one could have defeated him in 1972. Senator George McGovern speaking at Oxford University two months after the election. If you were to run for Senate in Colorado and win, would you then consider running for the presidency itself? Yeah, I'd do almost anything after that, even run for president. Although, I wouldn't really want to be president. As a matter of fact, early in the 72 campaign, I remember telling John Lindsay that the time had come to abolish the whole concept of the presidency as it exists now and get a sort of city manager type president. 
We have come to the point where every four years this national fever rises up, this hunger for the savior, the white knight, the man on horseback, and whoever wins becomes so immensely powerful, like Nixon is now, that when you vote for a president today, you are talking about giving a man dictatorial power for four years. I think it might be better to have the president sort of like the king of England or the queen and have the real business of the presidency conducted by a city manager type, a prime minister, somebody who is directly answerable to Congress, rather than a person who moves all his friends into the White House and does whatever he wants for four years. The whole framework of the presidency is getting out of hand. It's come to the point where you almost can't run unless you can cause people to salivate and whip on each other with big sticks. You almost have to be a rock star to get the kind of fever you need to survive in American politics. That public men publish falsehoods is nothing new. That America must accept, like the historical republics, corruption and empire has been known for years. Be angry at the sun for setting, if these things anger you. Watch the wheel slope and turn, they are all bound to the wheel, these people, those warriors, this republic, Europe, Asia. Observe them gesticulating, observe them going down, the gang serves lies, the passionate man plays his part, the cold passion for truth hunts in no pack. You are not catalysts, you know, to lampoon these crude sketches of Caesar. You are far from Dante's feet, but even farther from his dirty political hatreds. Let boys want pleasure, and men struggle for power, and women perhaps fame and the servile to serve a leader, and the dupes to be duped, yours is not theirs. <laughs>